You may be seated. Let us pray. Now may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in thy sight. O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. We'd like to welcome our YouTube audience as well and uh, to our service today. And uh, we pray now that uh, the Lord would just open up all of our hearts to his word. We've got a series going called The Life of Christ uh, from the gospel lessons for this time of year as we're following Jesus from Bethlehem to the cross. And today we're looking at Luke 4, 31 through um, 44 at the power of Jesus, the power of Jesus. Um, Friday morning, Friday morning I got two calls, boom, boom, uh, both from people outside our church, outside our community, and uh, they said we have two people in our lives, <clears throat> one maybe about uh, 30 miles from here and another about 50 miles from here, uh, and, and they're suffering from very, very serious depression. Could you possibly go and see them? And um, very serious. And it's just that time of year. It's that time of year when uh, a number of people suffer from depression. Uh, I remember that from our years of living in Alaska. Uh, it's a rough, rough time of year for that. And we needed to do something about that. And I went and saw somebody uh, yesterday and I uh, had a very good visit. And uh, probably Monday or Tuesday, as soon as I can, uh, as soon as I can get there, we'll get up and see the other individual who's suffering from serious depression. We have to be vigilant about this in our friends and relatives, and many times we need to intervene before it's too late. And um, thankfully, in one case, uh, the intervention came through a doctor's appointment and medication uh, mitigated some of the effects of the depression. And so that was thankful. It was from, away from the dangerous point. And, but as we deal with these forces, we need power. We need power. We need power to fight depression and sickness and demons and mental illness and disease and uh, lack of faith, lack of faith, unbelief. We need power from on high. And, and Jesus demonstrates today that power to us. This same Jesus is with us, and, and, and he dwells in us by the Holy Spirit. And I want you to be encouraged that what he is doing there um, is just available in some form to us today as believers. Let's talk about it for a minute. First of all, Jesus has power over demons. Jesus has power over demons. Luke 4, 31 through 37, and somebody should go take care of the pizza man. Luke 4, 31 through 37. Then he went down to Capernaum to a town of Galilee, and on the Sabbath began to teach the people. They were amazed at his teaching because his message had authority. In the synagogue, there was a man possessed by a demon, an evil spirit, and uh, he cried out with a loud voice, Ha! What do you want with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. Be quiet, Jesus said sternly. Come out of him. Then the demon threw the man down before them all and came out without injuring him. And all the people were amazed and said to each other, This, what is this teaching? With authority and power he gives orders to evil spirits and they come out. And the news about him spread throughout the surrounding area. There was an outcry when Jesus entered the synagogue. The demonic spirit cried out of a man, what do you want to do with us? You've come to destroy us. I know who you are, the Holy One of God. This demon knew who Jesus was, and the demon reacted to the presence of Jesus. This demon was terrified because he knew that Jesus had the power to destroy him. The demon, though, wasn't an atheist. Did you notice that? 
No demons are atheists. But he wasn't a believer either in the sense of saving faith. Uh, he knew who Jesus was and identified him. Uh, this emergency room doctor I got to know in Superior, Wisconsin, was a Christian. So it made his life as a doctor kind of interesting in the emergency room where you see so many uh, challenging and unusual things. And he had great spiritual insight. And I'll never forget that he told me once, he said, the reason people react to us negatively sometimes, and there's no reason for it. No reason. They just meet us, they don't like us, and react negatively. He said, is spiritual. There's a spirit inside them that reacts to the Holy Spirit inside of us, just like this demon reacted to the presence of Jesus. And that explains a lot. It explains a lot why some people just dislike us for no reason. Because there's a spirit in them that reacts to the Holy Spirit in us. Notice Jesus commanded the demon to be silent. He never allowed miracles or exorcism to become a spectacle. He wanted the miracles to testify of who he was. But his point always came back that he wanted to preach the gospel. But as we deal with, whether it's depression or uh, mental illness or even more so uh, a demonic presence in people's lives, there's a difference between the two, mental illness and demon possession, but sometimes they can be tangled up. And sometimes they can be partly medical too. We need the power of Christ to deal with these things. And that's why it's just so important that we... Um, that we just be strong in the Lord and, and have that power in our lives and know it and believe it by faith because we're dealing with real spiritual power many times in our lives. Acts 20, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. Ephesians 5, 18, be filled with the Holy Spirit. I need to be prayed up on Monday or Tuesday when I go and see that depressed man. I need to be prayed up, and I need to have people standing behind me as I do these things because we're dealing with powerful forces. And then the second thing we see here is Jesus has power over illness, power over illness. Luke 4, 38 through 41. Jesus left the synagogue and went to the home of Simon, that's Peter. Now, Simon, Peter's mother-in-law, was suffering from a high fever, and they asked Jesus to help her. So he bent over her and rebuked the fever and left her. She got up at once and began to wait on him. them. When the sun was setting, the people brought to Jesus all who had various kinds of sickness and laying his hands on them, touching them, each one he healed them. Moreover, demons came out of many people shouting, you are the son of God. But he rebuked them and would not allow them to speak because they knew who, that he was the Christ. You know, we, we, we don't get too nervous about high fever anymore, do we? We ought to, Andrew, right? But we don't get too nervous because we have Tylenol and, and we have doctors and we have antibiotics. And without those things, most of us in this room over the age 50 would be dead already. Really, we would be. Uh, but it says here that Peter's mother-in-law had a high fever. And in those days, that pretty much was a death knell, a death wish. I mean, that, that was it. They didn't have antibiotics. They didn't have Tylenol. And um, Peter's wife must have been very distraught. It was a desperate situation. I bet, Alexis, you were a little distraught there for a day or two or more um, when Andrew was so sick. Um, and notice that Jesus bent over her as he rebuked the fever. Time and again, he touched them. He laid hands on them. He held the hand of the dead person. He touched them. And I think that's very significant. Uh, Jesus was not afraid of getting sick, and he was not afraid of getting labeled, especially as touching something ceremonially 
unclean. And you know, that reminds me of pictures I've seen of Mother Teresa of Calcutta, how she would hold these lepers and these horribly sick and infectious people as they were dying in the streets. And she'd hold them in her arms as they died in her arms. Can you imagine how good that felt to them to be touched, to be touched uh, as, as they were dying. I think of Matthew 25, 40. The king replied, I tell you the truth, whatever you did for one of the least of these brothers of mine, you did for me. Uh, one of my favorite scenes in Cecil B. DeMille's Ben-Hur uh, is when Judah goes into the cave of the lepers looking for his mother and his sister. And he finds them. And with no fear, he picks them up. His either mother or sister, he picks her up and carries her in his arms and takes her home to take care of her. And, 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 and um, I'm not advocating foolishness. I'm not advocating foolishness as we deal with disease, uh, folks. But I am going to speak up. I am going to speak up. I visited this man the other day. He's so afraid of getting sick that he said, I've cut off myself from all of my friends who are unvaccinated. <laughs> I was tempted to say, cut yourself off from the vaccinated ones too, because they can get sick and spread disease too. He was in prison. He was in a prison of his own making. I have loved ones that are in that same prison. They have been for two years. Do you know how many people in the nursing homes desperately need somebody to touch them and hug them and hold them with no fear of giving or getting sick? Folks, I'm not asking you to be foolish. But the fear of fever has become a fever of fear. And we need to touch one another and lay hands and hold each other. Risk it. Risk it. Maybe it'll get you to heaven early. Jesus touched them. Jesus touched them. Use wisdom. I shared with this man I visited the other day, uh, Psalm 121, verses 7 and 8. The Lord will keep you from all harm. That's the short run. He will watch over your life. That's the long run. And then the Lord will watch over your coming and your going, both now and forevermore. That's for eternity. Folks, you work this out on your own. You work it out on your own. But we need to touch people and pray for them. They desperately, desperately need it. Don't tell on me, but I go in the nursing home and I shut the door and I disobey the rules because I know what Ray Bester needs. I know what some of the others need. I know that Gloria Conrad needs a hug. And if it gets me kicked out, so be it. But that's what I'm going to do until then. And then power over illness. And then finally, power in the pulpit. Luke 4, 42 through 44. At daybreak, Jesus went to a solitary place. The people were looking for him. And when they came to where he was, they tried to keep him from leaving them. But he said, I must preach the good news in the kingdom of God to the other towns also, because that is why I was sent. And he kept on preaching in the synagogues of Judea. Jesus shows us his priority. His priority is preaching the good news. And we see this in three important words. I must preach. Helping the troubled is important. Helping the ill is important. But preaching the gospel, getting the Bible translated, that is 
primary. That's primary. The problems of this world are all symptoms. The problems of this world are all symptoms of lack of faith of lack of knowledge of the gospel of Jesus Christ. The devil brings trouble. Jesus brings blessing. The devil is the curse maker. Jesus is the curse breaker. Jesus did not say he came to cast out demons and heal the sick. He said, I have come to preach the good news of the kingdom and then emphasized that is why I was sent. Our primary goal is to get the Word of God out. Lovingly, caringly, meeting needs, but our primary goal is to get the Word of God out. Our neighborhood around here is filled with up-and-outers. <laughs> up-and-outers, not down-and-outers. They have expensive homes, cars, fine food, and clothing, but many of them are starving in their souls. Something is missing, and even this morning, they're getting up, and in the midst of luxury that nobody in the world knows except the top 2%, which is us, and they're saying, is this all there is? Is this all there is? Our area here within a mile of the church needs the gospel just as much as Tanzania. In fact, probably Tanzania today has more people within a mile of where you're standing who know the gospel than this spot right here, right now. And many of them will realize and are beginning to realize if they're getting as old as I am that they're going to lay down and just give up everything they've worked so hard to accumulate. And it comes quickly. It comes quickly. And they have nobody to share the gospel with them. How many houses have we in the past seven years since I've been here effectively shared the gospel with in the past seven years? Almost none of them. Almost none of them. I'm preparing for the annual meeting here, see. The chaplain of Redeemer Nursing Home in South Minneapolis told me one day that he was a parish pastor and it was very unrewarding because he led so few people to Christ. He got called to be the chaplain of Redeemer Nursing Home, Redeemer Healthcare in South Minneapolis, and he said, I have led dozens of people to Christ because they're at the end of their life and they're open. They're open. And it's been so exciting to be a nursing home chaplain and lead so many people to Christ. Our annual meeting is going to be in a few minutes. And one big question looms in my mind above all else, and that is this. How can our little church effectively bring the good news of Jesus Christ and his kingdom uh, to this area in which we live? It's only by the grace of God that it can be done. But uh, remember 1984, I was here passing out leaflets door to door, 1984 or 85, somewhere around that time. And, uh, and, and Wayne Hansen called it the Miracle Mile. We're going to reach every house within one mile of the church. And guess what? Aside from Bruce and Cindy Knight, I think every house has got a new family in it. Huh? Every house has got a new family in it since that time. And we just need to resurrect the Miracle Mile and Wayne wants to pray about it. Wayne says, don't worry about praying for my health. We want to pray for souls to come to Christ and we want to pray for our nation and there's leaders. There's power in the blood of Christ to cast out demons and oppressions and obsessions. There's power in the blood of Christ to heal diseases and protect us from diseases, and if we don't get it, if my hugging, <laughs> I had a relative call me, he says, how do you do what you do? Aren't you afraid? And I said, no, I'm ready to die. And if my hugging gets me to heaven early, there's power in the blood of Christ to save my soul and take me to heaven. 
Uh, there's power in the blood of Christ, and there is power in Christ for us to effectively reach our friends, neighbors, loved ones, and even this neighborhood of up and outers. And let's seek God and pray to that end. Amen. Shall we sing together hymn number 544, Power in the Blood. Thank you for worshiping with us today. For more information or to contact us, please visit us on the web at mnvalleychurch.org or find us on Facebook at Minnesota Valley Church.